Today's scripture reading will be from the book of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 20 through 26. Again, Matthew 27, verses 20 through 26. And it says, now if you want to follow along in the Pew Bible, it can be found on page 879. And starting with verse 20, it says, But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that should ask for Barbados and destroy him. The governor answered and said to them, Which of you two do you want me to release? They said, Barbados. Then Pilate said, What shall I do with Jesus you call, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. Then the governor said, What evil has he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not be prevail at all, but rather than a tumult was rising, he took the water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this person. You see to it. And the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barbarus to them. And when he had, had scourged, Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Thank you, brother, for the reading. Today we'll be talking about the interaction between Pilate and Jesus and how Pilate reacted to Christ. And I want us this morning to think about indifference. And I want us to think about being intrigued. And then I'd like us to think about uh, irreligious. Irreligious. And we think about these things concerning Pilate. Pilate committed heresy. And I want us to think about the idea of heresy. Heresy is having an opinion about something that is orthodox. Or having a contrary opinion about what, what is orthodox. Someone can have a view, an understanding about something that the Bible doesn't teach. And we call the Bible orthodoxy or orthodoxic. The idea there is made up of two words and the idea is the right thinking. Right thinking is the idea of the word orthodox. And so we are to think right because the Bible thinks right. And if we think like the Bible, then we're thinking right. We are orthodox. But sometimes People don't think like the Bible, and they think what they think is right thinking, is orthodoxy. You still with me? So we find that Pilate had committed heresy because he spoke against and acted against the truth. The truth is... That which is. That which is which cannot be denied. And so, in a manner of speaking, he had committed heresy. In John chapter 1, beginning in verse, or John chapter 8, beginning verse 31, Jesus tells us that all those who continue in his word are his disciples indeed, are truly his disciples if they continue living, if they continue abiding in, remaining in, and living like they're supposed to do in His Word, then truly they are His disciples. And then He says right after that, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So if we continue in His Word, Jesus tells us we're continuing in His truth. So the truth and His Word are synonymous. In John chapter 17, beginning of verse 17, Jesus is in the garden praying. 
And while he's praying, he says, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. So again, talking about orthodoxy, about right thinking, we're talking about truth. We're talking about truth. Jude, verse 3, tells us to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto all the saints. The faith is the word, is the truth. We are to contend earnestly for the truth, for the faith. And so heresy is that which goes against God's word, which goes against truth, which goes against the faith. And as we think about the interaction between Pilate and Jesus this morning, we're going to be looking at John chapter 18. So be turning your Bibles to John chapter 18. The beginning portions of John chapter 18, Jesus is praying that we just read from Matthew chapter 27, that Jesus is praying in the garden. And Judas has gone out to do his thing. He's going to betray Jesus. And so when Jesus was done praying and done talking to his disciples, he was getting ready to go. He was resolute. He was resolved. You remember that just a few moments ago, he was praying in the garden and sweat was dripping down off him because he was thinking about you and he was thinking about me. He was thinking about dying for you. But like most people, you run things through your mind. And Jesus was running that through his mind. Is it really worth it to die for Doug? Is it worth it? And so he began to sweat. Just to think of the pure pressure. And sweating like as if it was blood dripping down. He prayed three times. And then he realized that the answer is, God's not going to take, take away this cup of suffering from me. I know now what I have to do. I have to die. I have to die an excruciating death. And I have to do my Father's will. And so he was resolved. He got up. He had his mind fixed on the assignment, that eternal assignment that he had to carry out. And so as he's in the garden, Judas brings the guards. And the guards come in and they ask, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I'm he. Here I am. They were astonished. They fell back. They had no idea what to do. And while they were backing up, Jesus says, hey, you asked for me, here I am, come take me. And then a third time he says, I'm he. I'm the man that you're looking for. Of course, he was betrayed with a kiss by Judas, one of his own, one of his supposed friends and followers, betrayed with a kiss. Well, he is questioned by Annas the high priest, and then he's questioned by Caiaphas, and he's beat up and he's punished. And then he is brought over to Pilate. And that's what we want to read this morning, beginning in John chapter 18, beginning in verse 28. John chapter 18, beginning in verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early in the morning. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but they, that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. Duh, is what they're we're saying. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, 
It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. And so we find here the first word that we want to look at. The idea of being irritated. Irritated. Notice what he said. John said it was early in the morning. Now how many of you, dear friends, are able to function early in the morning? And if you can function, how many of you are willing to hear a most stressful issue? No, we cannot hear it. We don't want to hear it. We haven't even had our coffee yet. Pilate is irritated. And not only that, he asked him, he said, why are you bringing him here to me? And they're essentially said, because the law requires us to, Pilate, because this guy is worthy of death. And Pilate said, well, why don't you consider it amongst yourselves and your own law? And again, the Jews said, Pilate, I know it's early in the morning, but we have to bring them to you. You have to make the call. We can't put any one of the Jews to death without your consent. And so Pilate, therefore, was irritated at the thought and the issue of handling Jesus. And I think, from that reading, Pilate represents a whole lot of people who are irritated with Jesus. Now, if you look through the Gospel accounts, you're going to find Jesus irritated quite a few people, did he not? I mean, in every book, in just about every chapter, people are wanting to hurt him or to kill him because of what he had to say to them. A lot of people are irritated at Jesus today. And a lot of people are irritated with those who follow Jesus today. Why? Because they're irritated with what Jesus had to say. With what Jesus taught. There were a lot of people that do not like what Jesus had to say concerning marriage. Jesus said that marriage is between a man and a woman. And then he goes on to explain it even further. He says, male and female, he made them. Now we live in a culture where we can't understand the two genders, the two uh, genders that we have, male and female. Now there are more than just male and female. But Jesus said he made them male and female. And these two groups are the groups that are candidates for marriage. Nothing else. No one else but those two groups. There's not a third group, and there's not a fourth group. But people like to add third, fourth, and fifth, and so on groups because they don't like the words of Jesus. Jesus has irritated people today. He continues irritating people because he said he is the only way to heaven. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Oh my. A lot of the people in the world today have lost their minds because of those words. Why, he's arrogant. Who does he think he is? That he is the only way to heaven? Why, there are many other ways. And so people are irritated still today with Jesus. And certainly... Pilate is one who represents all those irritated with Jesus. So again, Jesus did do a lot of 
irritating of people. And so we find here this morning his first reaction to Jesus and to the situation that he finds himself in is irritation. But we also know, as we think about truth, Pilate is later going to tell us what is truth. And so he represents a lot of people in the world who say the same thing. What's truth? Oh, I have my truth and you have your truth and, and so everybody has their own little truth. And who are you to tell us what, something, what, what is really true? You have no right. There's no objective standard. The standard is within my own heart. And again, that sounds like the book of Judges, where there was no king in the land of Israel, but everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so we live in a culture that is the same way. But when we look at John chapter 18, and look at the following verses, John chapter 18, beginning of verse 31, Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. And so Jesus here is understanding what the scriptures have said concerning him, that he is going to die. Over and over again, Jesus tells his apostles that he is going to die. And not only that, he gives them more details than that. He tells them that he's going to suffer. That he is going to be brought before the Sanhedrin. And that they're going to judge him. And that they're going to find him guilty. And that they're going to crucify him. And so he's well aware of what is going to happen to him. And that's exactly why he was sweating the way he was sweating in the garden while praying to the Father, Father, if it be thy will, take this cup away from me. But he realized that he had to go through with it. And he realized the fate that waited for him at the cross. And so, again, being well aware, irritated, irritated because he had to get involved. That sounds like people today. You mean to tell me I have to do something to be a Christian? You mean to tell me I have to be involved? I have to be involved with other people's lives? Yeah. You do. To be involved, that's irritating. Irritating so much that I don't want to be a part of his church. And so people understand that when they become a Christian, they have to change. Change what? Change their thinking, of course. Change their behavior, of course. That is, change their lifestyle. But that's an infringement upon many people's lives. And therefore becomes irritating because they don't want to change and be more like Jesus. They want to be themselves. They want to express themselves the way they are instead of expressing themselves for Christ. Well, talking about irritation... They don't want to change their values. They don't want to change their morals. They don't want to change their standards. Oh, I know what the church says. You hear people say that all the time. But I don't, I don't agree with what the church says. It's not really about what the church says. It's not really about what I say. It's about what our Lord said in Scripture. That's what counts. And so the standard, which is truth, is the objective standard that we must live by. Can it be irritating for us? Sure it can. 
But we learn to live more like Jesus every day. And those things that we once thought were irritating are now things that we love and enjoy. Because we're following Jesus Christ. We're living a way that He wants us to live. Remember, the Bible tells us it's not going to be easy. He says, enter in by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many go therein by it. But narrow is the gate and narrow is the way which leads to life. And few find it. Because difficult is the way. Difficult is the way. So being a Christian, being a follower of Christ, is not an easy task. Because we have to deal with my desires, the things that I want to do, I have to sacrifice them for Christ's and live according to His way. For many people, that's irritating. That's something that is so very uncomfortable. And we all don't like to change. Now, just look at where you're sitting this morning. I think you understand what I mean by that. You're sitting in the exact same spot that you always sit in. Well, it becomes comfortable. We all agree with that. We all understand that. But it represents who we are. It represents that it's hard for us to change. And if you can't change your seat, what makes you think you're going to change your life? That's why it's irritating. But Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's not like all those other thou shall nots and you shall do's. He said it's so much more simplistic than even that. Because if you mess up, and he says you're going to mess up, by the way. If you mess up, you have my blood to forgive you. They didn't have that handy and ready for them in the Old Testament. They needed that blood. So they had to use the blood of animals until Christ came. And the blood of animals couldn't take away the sins of the world. Couldn't certainly take away the sins of the Jews. Every sacrifice reminded them on a yearly basis that their sins were still unforgiven as they wait for the coming Messiah. So irritation is the first response. Intrigue. Intrigue is the second reaction. We think about uh, Jesus during His ministry. Many people were intrigued by Jesus. Now when you see people being healed of their sicknesses and their illnesses, and you see people rise from the dead, and you see loaves of bread being multiplied and fishes being multiplied and you see people like Jesus walking on the water and so forth and so on, you become very intrigued. Now they weren't in love with Jesus, but they surely were intrigued by Him. In fact, in Luke chapter 4, when He comes to His hometown, before they run Him out of town, they were intrigued by him. He said, who is this man? Is this, this, is this not Joseph's son? The carpenter's son? Where did he learn to talk like this? No person, not even the Pharisees, speak like Jesus. So they're intrigued by Jesus. And so, Pilate, he did not want to be bothered with Jesus. And yet, he comes to him in the next verse. 
uh, beginning in verse uh, 32, 33. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Here's his first question. He's intrigued by this. What's Jesus' response? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? Did someone put you up to this? Are you really searching for truth, Pilate? Do you really want answers? Or did someone tell you just to come up here and ask a question about me? And so Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Now he's intrigued. What did you do? And so when we think about the idea of being intrigued, we're looking at a phenomenon that draws our attention to something or to someone. We're intrigued by it. We don't quite understand it. And so we try to find out more about it. We need a little bit more information. And so, again, when he asked the question, are you the king of the Jews? It was not a simple yes or no answer. Because no, he was not the king of the Jews in the sense that he was a political king, that he was going to stomp Rome down, and that they were going to rule the world. That's not the type of king that he was going to be. But yes, he is the king according to the scriptures of the Jews. The Hebrew scriptures. Everything pointed to him as being the Messiah. And being the Messiah would also be king. And so Jesus tells him about his kingdom. And he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from this world. I want you to think about this. Pilate could have stopped and said, wait a minute. That's not true. There's a fellow we have by many witnesses who said just a few hours ago that he cut off the ear of Malchus, one of my servants. Was he not fighting for you? Now he could have said that. He could have brought that up. And I'm sure he thought about it. But I'm also aware of the fact that the Jews wanted nothing to do with that. They didn't want to bring in the miraculous aspect of Jesus. They had been witnessing them about the miracles of Jesus for three years. The people have too. That's why his fame spread throughout Judea, spread throughout the land. And that's why people were intrigued with Jesus. But having to explain the miracle? Notice there's complete silence about that here. I said Pilate could have brought that up as an issue, but he didn't. And I believe the silence here speaks volumes. Because Jesus would have responded simply this, by saying, well, if that's the case, why don't you bring this old boy, Malchus, and present him to the court? And let's take a look at his ear. And of course they would understand that the ear was completely healed. It was returned to its normal state by that miracle that Jesus touched his ear. And so that was not a response that he was going to give at this time. So again, he says, Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. 
Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So he's not saying he's not a king. He is saying he is a king. Based upon the words of Pilate himself. But he did not want to get caught up in the idea of trying to define his kingship. Yes, I'm a king. But I'm not going to tell you that I'm a political king. I am a king of the Jews. Indeed, I am. By their own scriptures, I am their king. And he says, this bears witness to the truth. Ah, notice what Pilate responds with. Pilate said to him in verse 38, What is truth? What is truth? I don't think Pilate asked that question with a stern look on his face. I believe he had a little smirk on his face. And I believe that he asked that question both tongue and cheek. He knows what truth is. It is what it is, as they say. That's truth. They understand what truth is. It's a fact. But he is saying, in this particular case, he doesn't want any part of what he thinks is coming. And he's pretty sure about what is going to be coming next. And so he says, well, what is truth? You have your truth. They have their truth. I have my truth. And so we find that the idea of looking for truth is not exactly a tantamount thing for Pilate at this point. He says, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. None. None whatsoever. But... We come to verse 1 of chapter 19. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put him on a, a purple robe on him. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold the man! Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. And then, of course, again, he says, Behold the man. Nothing wrong with this man. But he knew what was coming. He knew there was going to be a riot had he not caved to the political pressures of those Jews. And so... They gave him a choice, Barabbas or Christ. And of course, they chose Barabbas. Free Barabbas! Crucify Christ. Crucify Him. And the point in all of this, friends, is that everyone is going to have to deal with Jesus sooner or later. And Jesus is that one who's going to come and judge the world based upon what they thought and what they think of Jesus and who He is. Pilate washed his hands of the whole matter. But he too did not really do away with the matter. He's going to answer for that. Just like all of us are going to answer, have we washed our hands of Him? Have we washed our hands of His cause? Have we washed our hands of our faith? We'll be dragged before the court of Christ one day. But Jesus still gives us time. And Jesus loved the world so much that He gave Himself for it. He died for you and me. He went through with it. For the joy that was set before Him. And He still says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Do you believe that this morning? Do you accept the words of Jesus this morning? Are you willing to put Him on in baptism if need be this very hour? And understand that you are in the grace of Christ when you come up out of the waters of baptism? 
that you stand preserved, that you stand justified, that you stand sanctified because you obeyed a command that brought you to the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. You can do that this morning. If you've done that already, perhaps perhaps you need to change your mind and come back to following Christ one more time. And give yourself, devote yourself to Him because that's what He's asking for. He's asking all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. Won't you come as together we stand and sing? Bring Christ your broken life, so marred by sin, He will create a new, make whole again. Bring your empty, empty years, He will restore, and your iniquities remember no more. Bring Him your every care, if great or small, whatever troubles you, oh, bring it all. Bring Him the haunting ears, the nameless dread, by heart He will relieve and lift up thy head. Bless Savior of us all, Almighty friend, His presence shall be ours unto the end. Without Him life would be thou dark, how drear. But with his morning breaks, and heaven is here. Our closing song this morning is going to be 190, 190. After that, we're going to sing the first verse only, and uh, Brother George Tripp will come and lead us in our closing prayer. 190.